Time to start. Uh, thanks for coming to my talk today about using Jupyter Notebooks for data-driven visualization workflows. And I'm very happy that it's Friday afternoon, last day of the conference, and still so many people are here. Uh, my name is Jan Hendrik. I'm a physicist and currently working as a freelancer in software development. And um, I'm very interested in scientific visualizations, and I thought, can Blender be a tool for visualizing scientific data? And how can I pipe data from Python notebooks, which are quite broadly used by scientists? And um, what are the ways we can visualize that? And yeah, I, I came across notebooks as a very nice platform to, to make this pipeline. And to start with a small teaser, what we will look at today, I have on the left side here, uh, the Python notebook. On the right side, I have the Blender viewport. And here, I have an interactive um, data frame in JavaScript, because Python notebooks also um, support JavaScript. And let's see what happens when I uh, press categories or filter for certain um, elements in this data frame. And I can see that um, it's, um, yeah, for 12,000 rows, I can uh, directly pipe the data that is in these um, rows um, to Blender. Okay, but before we start with uh, these advanced examples, uh, I have a few questions to you. Who of you has used the Blender Python editor in Blender itself? Okay, that's the majority. And uh, who of you has used uh, Python notebooks before? Okay, about a bit more than half of the people. Okay, but uh, for the other half, I will um, now uh, go a bit into what notebooks are and how you can use them. So I have here a Jupyter notebook, and it's basically a Python script that can run cell-wise. So you don't run the whole script at once, but you can um, have smaller chunks in it. Um, let me... Uh, for example, I can run this cell, I can run it a few times, and the output of the cell will just come uh, below here. Um, the next thing I can do now is, so this is a specific notebook that is already connected to Blender. How we will do that, I will uh, tell you later more about this. And But the thing here is I can import the BPI model. That worked, and now I can say bpy context auto um, autocomplete also works and active object and with a bit of luck I should now get the cube which is this element I can also assign this to, an, to a variable and now I can do other operations with this one is for example to get a location of the cube that's at the origin. I can also uh, look for certain coordinates, like the z-coordinate in this case, and um, I can also assign values to it. So one, now the cube moved a bit up, three. I can also um, run operators li uh, like the plus equal. Let's make this a bit lower, plus equal 0 0.5. And when I run this a few times, then I will see my cube going up and beyond. Let's bring it back. <laughs> okay, here it is again. Um, the next nice thing about notebooks is that I can um, use packages, for example, the pandas um, package. Uh, who, have, who of you has, panda, has used pandas before? Okay, also quite a bit of people. It's, uh, you can think about of as something like Excel for Python. You can manipulate data frames in it and um, yeah, uh, run certain operations. Okay, when I run, run this cell, um, then we will see that uh, notebooks also can produce error messages. And uh, yeah, so the ones um, of you who used notebooks before might see, okay, I have uh, the object defined cube and here it says name plane is not defined, so I will go here, okay, this should be a cube, this should not be a plane, and now I run this again and I will now get the, um, the output of, the, of, the, of these properties of each vertex. 
And probably this looks quite familiar to you if you have used uh, geometry nodes before. Here we see this, this table on the, on the right is the same as the table here on the left. And another thing um, that I really like when run it, running um, notebooks with Blender on the side is that I can also um, call the render function and I save the render file, uh, render image to, the, to this image.png. I display the image. Um, this will take a few seconds. And then I will, the image will pop up in the, in the notebook. Um, yeah, and so when working with notebooks together, there are some, some uh, particular things one has to know. So the, when I would close the notebook, then Blender would also close. When I close Blender like this, then the notebook complains and sees, okay, Blender is not there, and it will automatically try to start um, with Blender when I restart the kernel here. At least it should do that. <laughs> okay, no idea why it's not doing it right now, but also it doesn't matter too much. I think you got the idea. And um, yeah, now I want to give some other use cases on why it's useful to use um, notebooks with um, Blender. Um, here I have an example of Network X. That's a Python package to um, uh, make graphs. So I can place nodes somewhere. I can link these nodes with, uh, with edges. So here I have a balanced tree. And this data is now piped into, the, into Blender, into the mesh. Um, then I can freely interact with this mesh, mesh in, in Blender. I can add geometry nodes. I can add shaders. I can uh, yeah, play completely freely play with that. And when I have a setting that I like, but I want to change the underlying data, I can also use uh, do that by just running the next notebook cell and um, replacing the data. Um, yeah, and when I have this particular image that I like, then I can also make this as a as an image output. Okay, but so far, the most of the things that you saw right now can also be done with just the internal um, Blender Python editor. And what makes um, notebooks very special and useful, or like open up a new field where to use Blender, is uh, by connecting JavaScript frameworks. So uh, these are called IPy widgets. You have a very basic IPy widget, which is a slider. And this slider, every time when the slider value changes, then um, Python takes care that the, the changes are also um, calling, uh, like making a change in the Python variable, and this also can then be transported to Blender. So this is a very, very basic example. I played a bit around with this, and maybe you've heard about the whiteboard teal draw. That's a React component, which um, apparently also runs in Jupyter. And um, now I took the, the stroke, so every stroke that I take, I, I will send it to, to Python. Python will pipe it to Blender. And uh, probably you've seen already here at the top, there is a um, DNA strand from uh, Brady's uh, molecular nodes that you've also probably uh, already seen. And yeah, when I now um, draw some lines, the lines are piped to Blender. I apply, I automatically apply the geometry nodes and I get these uh, sweet DNA, DNA strands. Um, the next example, this is just a toy example, um, what you can do with this. I, I took this whiteboard, I connected it to the uh, GPT-4 Vision API and here is a very simple prompt saying, okay, whatever you see on this canvas, I want you to uh, think of of a Blender scene which recreates this scribble from my scene and um, create Python code which will generate this scene. And it works like it almost never works, but in this very easy, simple case, it apparently also works. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no more I, I things in this talk. 
Um, the thing that you saw in the in the beginning is an interactive data table, and this is uh, based on the open source project Quark by Trevor Mans. And um, yeah, what you see here is uh, 12,000 um, 12, rows of housing prices in California. And I can then select certain ranges of um, houses and um, see the update in real time in Blender. Okay, and uh, next I want to talk a bit about the user interfaces that we have in notebooks. There are many, so a notebook is just an environment to run Python. Probably you've heard about Jupyter Lab. That's um, the most commonly used one, but there's also Visual Studio Code that has um, notebook support. Uh, then there is a very minimal one, minimal one with uh, almost no user interface uh, called Saturn. That's also the one that you saw in the demo. And then there's one, for example, called Marimo. This one works a bit different than other notebooks. So in this notebook, you have to run every cell by yourself. Marimo is a reactive notebook. That, that means when you run one cell here in, at the top, and you make some changes there, and then in cell five and cell six, you rely on this variable as well, then it will automatically run these um, below cells again. That's uh, quite convenient to, to get uh, all your cells in one state. Um, it's useful in some use cases. Um, so yeah, why, why should we use um, notebooks over the uh, normal editor? One thing while working on this um, that I found very useful is that you have um, the code and the output very, very close together. And for example, when, when I want to uh, give you the, the, the Python code that I worked on, it's sometimes difficult to, to, trans, trans, um, yeah, to, to give it to you. And normally I would do this by, by sharing the Blender file, but in this case, I could also share the notebook with you. And then uh, I have the, the images, the code, and I have these very minimal snippets that I can just copy paste and will, will get um, quite, quite easily reproducible results. Um, and there's a framework called MakeDocs, which also allows it quite easily to host notebooks as standalone, web, as, as standalone documentation pages. So this is how the, the page looks like. Here is a notebook. I can go through these uh, examples. And when I say, okay, I want to have this, I want to apply a bevel modifier, I can copy this code, control C, go to Blender, control V, and I will immediately um, be able to update this um, this object. And another nice thing is it has a search function. So when I want to, let's say attributes, I want to use attributes, then I can uh, quite quickly navigate there. Okay, um, next I want to mention that there are two ways of running notebooks in um, with uh, with Blender. One is without the Blender GUI, um, without the Blender GUI open. That's uh, the, the headless mode. And um, yeah, you just see you have the notebook, you have the code, you have the output, but you don't have a graphical user interface to interact with. The other one is um, where you have it side by side, where the notebook opens and you will uh, be able to either interact with the notebook or to interact with the Blender interface. Okay, next uh, we come to the installation. And uh, I was hoping it would be easy to install. And uh, with uh, Sophos two days ago, I tried the thing. And uh, yeah, after three minutes, he looked quite happy. So I'm, I'm sure that also you, if you want to try this, um, can have this smile. Um, the package manager that I'm using for installation is called UV. Probably you've heard about PIP. Um, UV is yeah, something similar written in Rust. Um, they claim to be a bit faster, which I think is um, a valid claim. It can be installed by, um, by one, one line of code. And uh, to run um, Blender in the headless mode, it's this one line. So you run UVX with BPy, Python 3.11, JupyterLab, and it will automatically cache all the, dep the dependencies. So even if you don't have Python installed, it will install Python for you, it will install the BPy module with you, uh, for you, and um, will launch JupyterLab. 
and they have um, they don't have virtual environments. They have like something um, like a like a local cache. So everything is just cached in this one folder, and as soon as you run this command, it will um, make this temporary um, virtual environment. And after you're done working, it will automatically destroy the virtual environment. So it's it's quite nice to work with. It's true. Um, the installation of the GUI mode is a bit more complicated. It's uh, writing two lines of code in the terminal. So UVX, Blender Notebook, install, and then you give the path to the, to the Blender executable. Um, and this is relying on this open source uh, projects on GitHub. And um, yeah, after that's done, you can say UVX, Python 3.11, JupyterLab, and then you can select the kernel and also start coding with the notebook and with Blender on the side. Uh, I have made the full instructions on, on, in this link. Um, I, I didn't test it too much on Windows, but on Linux and on Mac, it should work without problems. Um, yeah, maybe in future, there will be also a Blender extension that will um, enable this to work. So, uh, it's called the Notebook Connector. It's already a working prototype, but we didn't, uh, so it's mostly uh, written by Brady uh, Johnston, the one who is also the molecular notes guy. Um, yeah, but if there's interest in this, we can also probably provide this in the extension store. Uh, finally, I want to show you how to launch the notebook and Blender. So you select the Blender kernel at the top right. This is how you do it in Saturn. Here's how you use it in uh, how you do it in a Visual Studio Code notebook. There's a kernel picker at the top right. And for completeness, here is how to do it with JupyterLab. I say UVX, Python 3.11, uh, JupyterLab, and then open my notebook and select the Blender kernel. Yeah. OK, and next I have some um, demos prepared for you. So we will go through the whole pr uh, process of using data attributes to pipe our own data into Blender using notebooks. Okay, this one I don't need anymore. And um, Okay. <laughs> Live demos are <laughs> maybe not the best idea always, but okay, this <laughs> this seems to work. Nice. Um, yeah. So what I do here is I set up a fresh scene, and um, I'm mostly using the normal Python Blender API, except of that I have two custom functions. One is fresh scene that just deletes everything, but the um, uh, but the camera, and I have a second function that renders the result and displays the image and the Jupyter output. And now I can just run through this notebook and um, see how it updates my objects. The first time it runs, it will take about eight seconds, but when I run the cell again, it takes about 0 0.5 seconds. Yeah, and I can add grease pencil objects, I can add um, UV spheres, cones, cylinders, um, text, planes, empty objects, uh, lights, and I can also apply modifiers from a notebook. Um, yeah, this is a displacement modifier. And uh, the next nice thing is that I, uh, anytime when I want to have a certain information about my Blender project, I can also um, output information like the uh, screen resolution, the name, or even all the names of the objects in the scene. And by the way, if you want to um, have a look again at these things, um, they are all, these notebooks are all on GitHub, so you don't have to memorize anything, it's just uh, to have a reference for, for you to look up. Um, yeah, next I can also use colors. I can 
use colors also in in shading. So here is the shader node. Here is another example of an image that I can load over my notebook, from my notebook. And I can also set up more advanced nodes, for example, this um, gradient. Same goes for geometry nodes. So let's say I want to have this very simple setup of um, input, then a transform geometry and a group output. And when I run this cell, yeah, then I just got this node tree. And um, this is another way to pipe data from my notebook into Blender now. So uh, here I have this transform node and I want to um, change the scale attribute let's see, to three, to three. And uh, now I scaled it on the, on the z-axis. Okay, um, yeah, some other operations, save file, load file is possible. Probably you've seen a scene like this before. And it's possible to choose the render engine from EV to cycles. And it's also possible to manipulate the input of the geometry nodes. So here I have these long sprinkles and they have a certain um, sprinkle density. In this case, um, I think it's a 10 is the default. When I, when I want to decrease it, now it's 0 0.1, it can be 10 or it can be, um, yeah, now it's 10. And finally, the same goes for the, for the shaders. So with this notebook, I showed you that we already, with the parameters of geometry nodes or shaders, we have quite some, um, some, some possibilities to pipe data from our Python environment to notebooks, uh, to Blender. Uh, the next um, example will be a bit more data. So, so far we just said like uh, simple values, but let's say I have um, a CSV, a common separated value file of 142 rows. Um, I will just use matplotlib to see what happens when I plot it and I get this uh, cute dinosaur. Um, this notebook will now um, just, uh, this cell will set the camera from the top so that I can um, have, a, have a nice view from, from above. And the most simple way is now to write a for loop. So I say for x and y in uh, all my x values and all my y values, I want to add um, a UV sphere of radius 0 0.2 at this, at this x and y location and yeah, put the camera from above and render the result. And with a bit of luck, we will now get our dinosaur showing in Blender. Yeah, here it is. Um, same, so, and probably I want to now fine tune the scene a bit. That can be done by, for example, um, applying a material and maybe adding a black background plane. And this is already quite a nice scene. And this is not a very procedural workflow. So it, I've once loaded the data and now I can, uh, I can move certain points. But let's say I want to change the, um, the sphere to a cube for all instances. And that's not very easy to uh, done with this way. And it would be amazing to just um, have our points and apply geometry nodes, like mode geometry nodes, and then uh, go from there. And also, yeah, with this, just adding the objects, that's not very convenient. And instead, we will use another um, workflow where, where we add a new mesh, and the mesh will be the points from our data. Before we do that, I want to um, so I already prepared this very simple geomet geometry nodes um, set up in another Blender file. It's uh, just as this uh, instance on points with UV spheres. Um, and so this is a small script to load this um, uh, geometry nodes setup. 
Um, it's also possible to just load the whole new file. That's what I done with the, with this um, file. And uh, yeah, now I have um, for uh, like I have the default cube with a very simple geometry node set up. But I want to go back to my dinosaur. So what I do now is I create a new mesh. This mesh has uh, right now exactly one point, and yeah, nothing to uh, to be ex too excited about. Um, it only gets exciting when I now apply the geometry node tree that I just imported to to the scene, and yeah, now I will actually see the point. I can also set the radius to another value, and yeah, I will have now the the bigger sphere. Um, Okay, this was for a very simple case, but now I want to have the whole mesh. Like I, I, uh, I create a um, full mesh. I have this vector for all my values in X values and Y values. Um, and I add this to my scene. I add a geometry nodes modifier and now I have my dinosaur. And what I can do now is I can go into this instance or, or into this geometry nodes tree and I can change parameters. So for example, I want to have the, um, the, the spheres to have less segments or less rings and probably I want to rotate them a bit um, like this and I can now render the new result and I will have this more spiky dinosaur. And let's say I have this setup and it works for my data very well, but now maybe as a scientist I get new kind of data which I want to exactly, which I want to visualize with the exact same workflow. So um, I will now download another um, data set from GitHub, this uh, star. And when I now render the, um, the star, all the um, things that I've built on top of this um, data set is still there, but the underlying data changed. Yeah, and this is uh, a workflow that is possible with notebooks. Next, so this was um, now simple data, but sometimes you might have more advanced data sets or you want to have more control than just the x, y and z coordinate and that's where data attributes come in. So um, right now I start a new scene and I add this very basic plane with exactly four vertices and probably you've seen this table here in geometry, in, yeah, in geometry nodes, this spreadsheet. And um, there are four, uh, yeah, four rows with an X coordinate, a Y coordinate, and a Z coordinate. And here on the right, there's a lot of space. And this uh, space we might want to fill with our float values, with our color values, with um, custom vectors, or other, other data points. Yeah, okay, four, four rows. And with pandas, I can also visualize exactly this, um, this data table here. Um, the first thing I want to try is now to add a float value. So I, I say I want to have a new attribute name. It's called my float. And when I run this cell, now you can have a look here at the top right. And it added the float value. I can also just to be sure I will double check with the pandas data frame and also here I have the float value. Um, yeah, so, and in order to do something with it, now the next step is to apply a geometry nodes tree again. So as before, I just import the geometry nodes tree from another Blender file and I applied the geometry nodes tree and let's have a look what is inside here. So I have the UV sphere, I have an instance on points, I have the geometry input, the output, and the important part is this uh, named attribute here um, with the myFloat value, and this is exactly the myFloat 
that I just piped from the notebook into Blender. Uh, yeah, same here. I can do any variations that I want to, and I can now um, pipe new data, for example, this array here into the into the file, and I will get the according updates. Similar to adding geometry node trees uh, from the notebook, I can also remove them again, and I will be back at my at my plane. And um, yeah, just quickly, I want to go over some other examples. I can add an integer. I can add color values. These are red, green, and blue. I can, when, when I want to use these color values, I can add a geometry nodes, uh, in this case, shader nodes setup. Um, yeah, and I get this, this result. And so these code blocks are quite uh, convoluted and like quite, they, they are not that easy to just write down. It's better to just once know where they are and if you need them, you copy paste them and think of them as Lego bricks that you just place at certain points in order to get what you want and don't memorize them. Uh, finally, I want to add a vector. So this is a, a vector for x, y, and z co components. And when I now apply um, an offset and the offset is my vector, then I see that my plane is now shifted in space. Finally, I want to print the, the whole data frame again and yeah, this is kind of what I am expecting. Uh, one final remark on this is, currently I'm piping all my data into the, into the vertex domain, but there's also uh, the edge, the face, uh, yeah, like for edges and faces the same, this works as well. And yeah, this is for the vertex domain, this is for the face domain, and you can see, for example, for color values, here they are interpolated, here they are then just applied for the, for the face. Okay. Um, the next thing I want to show you now is how I can use JavaScript to pipe data. So, uh, here it is, yeah. Uh, so what we, we what we saw so far is that we can um, pipe simple numbers into our Blender scenes. We can manipulate um, geometry nodes with our scripts, and we can um, manipulate our meshes by adding integers, um, color values, whatever we we have in mind. Okay, and now comes the part where I add some very basic JavaScript to my notebook. Um, this is a slider which currently doesn't do much, but when I now access the value of this JavaScript slider by, uh, slider by widget.value, then the location of my cube will update. Okay, that worked, and this will work as well. But it's not reactive yet, so this is why I need this widget.observe um, function and uh, when I run this cell, the following thing will happen. Uh, Python knows now, okay, every time when this uh, value of the slider changes, then I will call the on slider change function. I will take the new value of whatever changed, and I will call this function called update cube translation, and the cube will update. So let's run this. And um, yeah, now I have the slider connected to my Blender cube. And to be honest, this is a bit like it's a bit inconvenient, and it would be nicer to have a, another way to just write this one line of code and automatically have the, um, the the value update. And on the internet, I found that there's already a proof of concept um, with Marimo for that. Um, it's it's not a completely working um, um, idea yet, but but here you see I just have the location x dot value y dot value z dot value, and these are my sliders without any observe function. So 
uh, I hope that when there's interest in this, uh, that we can get this working as well. Okay. Next, I will come to um, uh, adding custom JavaScript code. So probably you, you already have a JavaScript framework that you're using on a day-to-day -day basis and you want to pipe data from that framework into Blender. And um, for this, we can use any widget. And any widget is the, the framework to add JavaScript into Python notebooks. So I can, for example, use this, this counter widget here. And um, I have a Python value. And every time when something interacts here, the JavaScript function uh, makes sure that the state of this um, JavaScript object is also set to the, to the Python variable here. So uh, yeah, let's take this example here. Okay, I have the, uh, the button, which right now doesn't do anything. Um, and to show you that I can freely manipulate the, the JavaScript, I ha does somebody have a suggestion for a new color that we can Red. use? Red? Okay. Nice. You're a UI designer, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I have the red slider. And um, yeah, I can access the sli slider value. I can also define my um, updater function again, like my observe function. And okay, now the cube is esca escaping. But I see this is also in sync now. Um, yeah, that's, uh, but sometimes I uh, don't want, I want to be lazy and I don't want to write my own JavaScript code. And uh, luckily, we have NPN, and a lot of developers, web developers, already published their JavaScript front ends there. And here I have a very basic JavaScript app for like a vanilla colorful, it's a color picker that I'm importing. Uh, then here I'm defining a very simple function that, def uh, that um, calculates the brightness of the current color. And um, in this widget, I have um, a tradelet or this variable that is shared by uh, Python and JavaScript brightness value. So let's run this. Uh, script and it's also nice that you don't have to install anything so it just runs out of the um, when I'm in connected to the internet it just downloads from from this website and I have now this color picker value and I will again observe the widget and now oh, okay it's a bit uh, let me grab this a bit down okay now it's I think I have to run the whole script again because the cube escaped. That's why we should delete it. Okay, now it's, now it's back invisible. And when I now change the value of the slider, I will see that this corresponds to the brightness of the current color. When I, for example, don't like to change the, no, so in this case, it's the X coordinate. When I want to change this to the Z coordinate, it's just this one line of code that changes. And now I have it connected to the Z coordinate. OK, and now the final example, which I want to show you, is this interactive data frame. So the 12,000 rows of California. And um, on the right side, I have the Splendor file, which is currently empty. I, I have the uh, default cube with some geometry node setups. OK, this should have loaded something, but it didn't. Ah, OK, it's because I have the other file still open. Let me close. Both of them, yeah, now it's, now it's there. Okay, so empty, empty Blender file, a default cube in it, some lights. 
And I can now take the X and Y coordinates of this um, data frame loaded into a mesh. And with a bit of fantasy, you might already see the coastline of um, California up there. And yeah, um, I have a geometry nodes set up here. And what I can do now is, um, so this is the code to observe now for all the changes in the data frame up here. And based on the changes, I want to have a new um, attribute called the house value. And the house value is then used in the data attribute down here, median house value. That means if I change the, the data frame, then it will automatically update the house value at the z-axis. Let me um, apply the colors and the lights as well, and then we have this interactive data table with some nice visuals. Yeah, uh, all the code for this is online, so it would take, so I have eight minutes left, that would take too long to explain this, but if you're interested in this, uh, reach out and um, tell me about your use cases, so maybe you don't have data for, for just one year, but for 10 years, and you want to um, quickly see, for example, climate data from 2008 versus 2015, and then um, have this in a data table, and just uh, by clicking one, one point, um, access that. Okay. Uh, so the next thing for, for, for this exploration is to find more use cases. So this was more of a like exploration of mine to, to see what is possible and how can we extend um, Blender to other platforms to, to see how to pipe data into it. And there's a Discord uh, Blender science um, channel. It has also, like since today, it has also a coding um, um, channel where you can come in uh, share your problems and probably some other people have similar problems and we can talk and maybe find some solutions for that. Then another thing is I want to add more snippets to the gallery that you saw in the beginning. So if you have solved some Blender Python problems already and you think how oh, this should be included and there should be one space to bring this all together, then also feel free to reach out. And another thing that while doing this, I tried to use some GPT-4 um, during the process, but it, it worked like 60% of the cases. There was a lot of hallucination and sometimes it was like, okay, this worked for Blender 3.0, but now for 4.2, it's not working anymore. And what I would like to have is a fine-tuned um, a fine-tuned model where um, we can say, okay, I'm using Blender 4.2. And these are the 10 snippets that work in Blender 4.2. And when I add this to my initial prompt, then the likelihood that it will not hallucinate is a bit bigger. And yeah, I think this would uh, simplify some geometry node workflows. Okay, um, takeaways from today's talk is um, notebooks can be used in Blender to iterate on datasets. It's possible to connect JavaScript, and there is a snippet gallery of Blender Notebooks. Okay, that was my talk. <laughs> thanks a lot, and uh, you can find me on social media, and also a uh, special thanks to the Prototype Fund and the Federal Ministry of Education and research of Germany for making this exploration possible. Are there questions? We have about five minutes. Yes. Thank you, thanks a lot for the talk. Uh, I have a question. Do you have plans for bidirectional data center? Like if most of, like, I think everything you show has transferred from widgets in the notebook to data in the blend side. Could you do it the other way? Could you maybe have something that Yeah, 
I haven't thought about it, but in theory, it should be possible because you can print properties into the notebook. So I don't see a reason why it shouldn't work the other way around, but I haven't given it too much thought. Yeah. And a related question, if you are copying, like when you load the CSV for the California housing crisis, for instance, you have data that lives in the notebook and then data that lives in the Splendor yes. Python environment. Yeah. Yeah, true. Is that something you know how to solve or...? Um, so, so far that was like 12,000 data points and just piping them worked fine. I haven't thought about how to use it with larger data. <laughs> but we, we can talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. That would be like a, for all these like scientific notebooks that are out there where the graphs are horrible. Yeah. <laughs> or I think they're fine, right? Yeah. Um, uh, but you could just switch out your renderer and then hit play and suddenly all your graphs would look really nice because they'd be rendered in Blender. Uh, I, how do you, I don't know, if I, I don't know how uh, practical that would be, but it's yeah. really cool. Uh, so, like in principle, it should be possible. Um, but then it's the question like, how much effort would it be to re implement the whole Matplotlib API? I guess yeah. it's like a, Yeah. But like the, the, the next step would be like wrapping them up into functions that have yes. API or just use someone else's API. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but nice thought. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Have you considered trying uh, using Toto and different IDE that has more AI integration, whereas, for instance, very simple to put a link to the Blender documentation as complex triggers? That would be helpful. Uh, I've I've used uh, a GitHub Copilot, yeah. um, but like I didn't find a way to a easy way to uh, link. There's a different IDEs for Coda. Uh, give it a try because it's much easier to add more. Okay, yeah, that's. I will try that. Thank you. Okay, other questions? Yes. Can we use the notebook for any prototypes on like reading software applications? Uh, what, what do you mean with reader software? I mean like a, like a program, like an app or something, like an editor or something. Like a finished product or something. Uh, no, not yet. Not yet. This is just a, like more a research project right now, but I think it should be also possible to uh, write add ons with notebooks. Okay, I think one, one more question, then the time is up, but yeah, yeah please. Um, I was wondering when you're using, because you're using like Blender as the kernel. Yeah. Um, if you import another library, uh, does that have to be installed into Blender's version of Python? Or does it, is it installed into the one that you're saying, you know, has like a temporary package? Um, like if you install a new, yeah, like the one you install. I, I think both of it is possible, but I'm not 100% sure right now. So what I normally do is uh, when I'm when I'm in the notebook, then I can type, uh, for example, uh, uv pip install uh, matplotlib. Um, okay, that was already inserted. Pandas. Okay, also well, let's say uh, polars. Ah, <laughs> another name. <laughs> okay, <laughs> <It's> a small one. <laughs> No, that's also already there. Sci-fi, sci-fi. Thanks. Ah, also already there. But it, it should work. It should work. And then you can import sci-fi. Ah. Okay. Okay. Nice. And let's let's see. Yeah, that worked. That worked. Yes, I know you can use that here. And uh, there's also the, the sub um, process pip install from Blender. I think that should work as well, but we can talk about this later.
Okay, and now time's up. Thanks for coming and uh, see you around.